Everybody get a hymn book and turn to page 424. Page 424. Everybody stand.
Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone back to, to church tonight. Hope you had a good afternoon. We had our associational Bible drill this afternoon, and, and I'm glad to announce that all the participants did well enough to make it to the state level. So we'll be um, heading there in a couple of weeks, so y'all continue to pray for those kids as they prepare over the next couple of weeks to go there. And um, so thankful for everybody who was here and supported them this afternoon and everybody's worked with them over the last few months. Um, if we have any visitors with us tonight, we I don't see any. If we have any, we're certainly thankful to have you. We look forward to worshiping with you. And our home ministry, always so thankful to have you. I hope you're doing well and um, and glad you can be with us. I'm going to read through our prayer request from this morning, and uh, we'll see if we got any more to add to it. Uh, let's remember the family of Danny Harrelson, let's remember Diane Tyndall, Junior Raven, Carolyn Carroll and family, Wesley Martin, Paul Winburn, Lacey Johnson, Mr. Uh, Barry Martin, Israel, Billy Graham, Nancy Euler, Mr. Joe Calhoun, Ms. Wanda Rabin, uh, John and Deborah Cartridge, Steve Owens, Tammy Jones, Mark Reamer, our Bible drill, and Amanda Marlowe's mother, Linda. Are there any other prayer requests, uh, either by the uplifting of hand or outspoken? I need to add to this. What was that last one? And certainly remember our teachers tonight. I'm sure they've worked hard to prepare for the season. Let's pray that all the classes go well. Also remember Will and Hearts. I think they're all going to um, Methodist Rehoboth tonight maybe. So they certainly remember their service tonight. Anyone else? Anyone else? Lord, so let's add to our prayer request list Dirk Lupo, Bill Raven, Paul Johnson, and uh, Pastor Larry, who will be in revival Wednesday and Thursday night. Is that Jones Creek? Is that what you said? Jones Street. Jones Street. Okay. In Tabor City. All right, if that's all we have, we'll go to prayer at this time. And I'd like to ask a Bronson if he would to come lead us in prayer tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today, Lord, and we just thank you once again for blessing us today to be able to gather back in your house to worship you, Lord. Lord, we pray, God, for the Bible drill participants, God, as they make their way to state, Lord, we thank you, God, for allowing them to uh, glorify you here, Lord, today as they've been studying your word. Lord, we know that it's not about the the stickers or the certificates or even the fact that they made it to state lord but it's the fact that they are hiding their, your word in their hearts lord lord god we pray god that you will use that word as a lamp unto their feet lord we pray god for our youth in this church lord no matter what they do is it, whether it's bible drill class camps whatever lord we pray god as they go to school as they leave this church that you'll just lord wrap them in your protection Lord, and we pray, God, for each and every prayer request mentioned tonight, Lord. We pray, God, that you will just be with those as they are, uh, Lord, whether fighting battles of sickness, be with their family, 
Lord, uh, be with the families of the one that, Lord, went on today. Lord, we pray, God, that you would just give them peace and comfort. Lord, God, we pray for Preacher Larry as he's in revival this week. Lord, that you'd hide him behind the cross. Lord, bring back the remembrance of things that he's going to be studying, Lord. Lord, allow him to uh, bring glory to you and honor to you as he brings the messages this week, Lord. Lord, as we gather tonight, we pray, God, for each and every teacher, Lord, represented tonight, that you'll just be with us as we, uh, Lord, do our best to, uh, Lord, study your word and bring your word to, uh, to those listening, Lord. God, we pray for our church that you'll strengthen us as we continue to serve you in everything we do. Lord, we thank you, God, for all that you've done for us and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I have a few announcements I'll run through. The uh, flower show is Thursday at 9 a.m. If you're interested in going, the sign-up sheet's still out there for today. Um, Senior Citizens Day will be May the 5th, and uh, Mother Dollar Supper, the sign-up sheet for that is in the back as well. That will be May 13th. Shannon Kite will be the speaker for that. Also, the nursery sign-up sheet is back there. If you um, feel like you'd love to help out in the nursery, please, please volunteer for that. And this will be the last night that we will have the sign-up sheet for the Zach Williams concert in Florence as well. That uh, concert is May the 4th from 7 to 10. Those tickets are $32, and if you're interested in going, please sign up and, and make your checks payable to Pledge Union Baptist Church. And uh, Laura is with Bruce tonight, so she asked if um, you want to turn any money to turn it in to me, and I will get it to her. Um, attendance this morning was 138. We had seven on YouTube for 145 total. And I think that's all I had announcement-wise. Does anybody have anything else? To, yeah, Pleasant Union Baptist Church, that's right. No, not Adam. No. I could use it, but, but, but I wouldn't feel right about it, Johnny. Anything else? All right, that's all we have. We'll dismiss the class at this time. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate those who have endured today. Um, many of us, some of us, half of us maybe, have been out here about six, seven hours. So uh, I feel, well, rest assured that I don't plan to, to run over tonight because I'm afraid I would lose half of you if I did. Matter of fact, I might lose half of you five minutes into this study. We'll see. But... Uh, those have been faithful today, Lord, and uh, Lord knows that uh, our bodies get weary, and uh, we've been so thankful of what we saw today in our church with the young people and those that support them in our Bible drill. It's just a blessing. Let's continue to pray for them as they move forward in their efforts to uh, praise the Lord through uh, the state drill in, a, I guess, a couple of weeks or whatever. But let's turn our Bibles in chapter 3 of First Peter. Um, we're enjoying trying to study this book, and uh, I appreciate Brother Peter having heard of some problems in the churches here, there, and yonder, taking the time to sit down and try to help the church get through some of these difficulties it was having. Uh, I do believe that every issue that Peter wrote on, he was aware that they did exist. And I don't think that early church and God saved people were any different much then than they were now than they were then. We had the same problems today that they had in the days of Peter. And we know that maybe their, their life was much more difficult because we know that the Roman government was causing all kind of problems for the nation of Israel. So, so Peter here is writing to the early church around uh, 64 A.D. 
and the church has now started being persecuted. And looking back just very briefly, we'll saw last, we saw last week where the theme of harmony seems to be running uh, through the course of the second half of chapter 2. That theme of harmony and submission will continue into our chapter, in st chapter 3 in our studies tonight. Last week we talked about uh, being in submission to the government. Uh, hard to do, but it, it's the law. You pay your taxes. Uh, you, you obey the speed limits. There are consequences if you don't abide by the rules of the government. There are also, we talked about being in submission, trying to work in harmony with your boss man at work. The boss and the employee, or the master and the servant, is what the Bible here refers to it as. Uh, we know that if you don't uh, do your part in that relationship and submit to the boss, there are, there are consequences, yeah, up to including discharge. So uh, th these are situations working for uh, your company and uh, living under the rule of the government. These are things that you must submit to. If not, there are problems. Now, tonight we're going to get more personal in our studies. As we announced this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about the man and the wife. The, uh, excuse me, the husband and the wife, the man and the woman, the husband and the wife. Um, and we won't get into politics too much, but we know the world as we know it. And our country specifically, we're having trouble defining that traditional relationship of marriage. Yeah. We're having trouble defining what is a woman. Yeah. Uh, our newest Supreme Court justice had difficulty and stumbled over the question of what is a woman. Uh, that's not that hard a question. Uh, but the world has made it that way. Uh, but we're going to study tonight where Peter gives instruction to the church that the woman and the man have their place in marriage. And we're not here to pick on anyone tonight, women especially, um, but we're here to share the word of God as Peter wrote it to the early church. So Peter begins chapter 3 with the word likewise. And again, I'll be aware of the time, and we'll try to make this thing brief. I don't think we'll get through half the chapter, to be quite honest with you, but let the Lord lead us all. So Peter here is saying to the church, likewise, making reference, we think, to him talking about being willing to submit. We don't like the word submit too much. In this society, in contemporary society, where we live today, the word submit has negative connotations. What do you think about when you think submit? You think of someone tapping out, giving up, raising the white flag, exit left. You're, you're, we seem to think submission is in itself a bad word. But if you look at this lesson today, submission is not a bad word. It's a word that shows that you're willing to be obedient to the Lord. And Peter here is writing to the wives. He said, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, we won't get into this a whole bunch, but I first, for the first time, I noticed the word own here. You wives, wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Now, you, wives, um, you, you work in a, in a community probably where there are a lot of husbands and a lot of husbands might be leading the group or the department. And uh, there are certain things you have to do relative to keeping your job and being uh, obedient to that employer, the male employer. Uh, but so far as being obedient and submissive, there's only one man in this world that you should be submissive to. Peter said it best, wives, submit to your own husband and not to somebody else's. You, you have no right you have no you have no responsibility to submit to other men outside that employee employer relationship and to read on here it says submit to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they being here the men they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives Peter is saying here, and I have a number of po bullet points I'm going to share with you, but in general, Peter is saying here, wives, and we think he's talking about the believing wives. They have faith in what Christ has done for them and saving them. He's also making the statement here, wives, you may not have a believing husband. And 
probably that was the case very often. And you probably know this too, but in a household, the husband set the pace in all matters, essentially. So whatever belief the husband had, the wife typically had the same belief. Now, they're living in Rome, and Rome had many, well, they're living in the Roman province, if you will, Roman dominion, and the Romans had many gods. It would not be uncommon for a Jew even to adopt some of those gods in the Roman Empire. But Peter's saying here, the believing wife, I want you to be aware of your responsibility and your opportunity in drawing, convincing, leading your husband to the Lord. He talks to you about your, your conversation. You can win your husband by the conversation, the way you live, the way you walk, the way you talk. So let's first talk a little bit about uh, relationships in general. Uh, first, let's talk about our relationship with God. Let's understand that a believer's relationship with God should enhance every other relationship in which we find ourselves. Because of your relationship with God, your relationship with your boss ought to be better. Your relationship with your spouse ought to be better. Your friends, your children, God enhances all other relationships. And I can't imagine any relationship that's more enhancing or enhanceable, if that's such a word, is the marital relationship. You know why? God designed the marriage. Amen. And God knows what it takes to make a successful marriage. And Jesus, I'm sure, he taught on that as he walked and talked with the disciples. So first off, to have a right relationship with other people, including your spouse, you've got to have the right relationship with the Lord. Simply put, God makes us better and makes all of our relationships even better. Also, let's remember that absolute submission to anyone or anything other than God is not called for in the Scriptures. Peter here addresses the marriage of the believing wife and the unbelieving husband. Peter tells his wife to be submissive to her own husband, as we mentioned before. A few things to remember here, three or four things here. And I think we'll all agree on these things. Men and women have equal worth. We're not here tonight to say a man is greater than a woman, or a woman is less than a man. In the eyes of the Lord, they're of equal value. He loves us equally. Also, men and women are inherently different. Surprise. They are. God made us that way. Amen. What does the world say about that? Mm, maybe not. There are very insignificant differences is what the world says. And it's got our children so confused across this nation. They're now declaring at early ages of six, I am not a boy, I'm a girl. I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. Today, anyhow. And our parents are so messed up They'll take that daily tendency, that feeling of the moment, and make movements to destroy that child's life. Yeah. Emotionally and physically and provide bodily harm, irreparable damage to a six-year-old that says, I'm feeling like I'm somebody different today than I was yesterday sexually. I saw a video, a documentary. It had a woman, I might have shared this with church, I don't know. And I'll be honest with you, I think it was a boy transition to a girl. And that mother, and he was eight years old, and that mother had her video camera rolling, and he, that child was in the hospital. That child was crying, and the child was about to go into surgery, and she was so excited she was going to get the sex of a child that she wanted. I think it was a boy transitioned to a girl, and she said, I'm going to finally have my daughter. And her in the hospital operating room, so glad of what was coming out of that operating room. She now had a child that was a sex that she preferred all the while. I could not believe it when I watched it. She was elated, happy that she was destroying the, the life of that child. It's unbelievable where we are. So we need to acknowledge, and the church does, but the world is messed up, that men and women are inherently different. Women, when did you find that out? Men, when did you find it out? Before marriage, 
or after marriage, did you find out more after you said I do than before you said I do? We knew sexually there was a difference, but in your tendencies, your likes, your dislikes, how you think about things, how you respond to things, you found out that you're a little bit different. Or did you find out that you're significantly different? Shortly after you said I do. And men, especially, you're probably still learning there are a lot of differences, aren't you? Yeah, man. <laughs> but there are differences indeed, and if we try to fail to if we fail to acknowledge that, it's gonna cause even more trouble. We has have to submit to the fact that God created man and woman and God made us different to complement one another and not to compete with one another. And that complimenting works out a lot better if we find ourselves to, to be submitted one to the other, the man and the woman. So we accept the fact we are just absolutely different. <clears throat> and thirdly, biblical submission is a response to biblical headship. Uh, and then we'll get now into some more grainier, some grainier stuff in the scriptures. We know God identified the man as a leader of the home, the priest of the home, if you will. And we're going to see explicit verses here where Peter's going to tell the women in the church, your husband is the head of the family. Now, to say that today could be uh, problematic to some. Many, some women, I shouldn't say many, it's often a woman says, there is no one going to boss me around. There's nobody head over me. Uh, I'm equal in this arrangement, this marriage relationship. But that's not the hierarchy that God put together in the scriptures. And we'll read on here. Dr. McGee said this regarding a woman, a wife, who's trying to lead her husband to the Lord. The wife is to preach a wordless sermon by her pure life which she lives before her unsaved husband. I heard a preacher say, and I don't know, he said he didn't know why this was, but he said, and he'd been pastor for 31 years. He said, I've seen many women, chaste, faithful, God-fearing women, lead their unsaved husband to the Lord. That's what he said. I have, he says, in 31 years, seen very few husbands that were good men of God lead their wife to the Lord. I thought that was unusual. He couldn't explain it. But it seems the woman living a godly life, circumspect from the world, faithfully and fully living, honoring God, has an influence over the man who's unsaved more so than the man over the woman. But Peter's saying here to the wife, don't miss out on your opportunity to lead your lost husband to the Lord. Ephesians, uh, we read, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, if we as believers in the faith, if we'll take this one verse it shows without a doubt the obligation we have as husband and wife. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as you would submit yourself to the Lord. Wow. Yeah. Wives, that may be really hard to do. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as to why it may not be easy for wives to submit themselves to the husband. But look at what it says to that old husband, Lila. Husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. So, women and men, if we'll behave this way as Christ behaved relative to the church, we won't have no problems recognizing who's in authority, who's in control. And we'll treat one another as God would have us to treat one another. So it says here we're to even husbands. Well, let's hold that comment for another minute. Just a minute. So obviously God wants both husbands and wives to treat their spouses with love and with respect. 
when the, wife, when the Bible says that wives should respect their husbands, it assumes such respect will be based on love, not fear. When it tells husbands to love their wives, it takes for granted that a uh, disrespectful love isn't love at all. You cannot mandate Respect, you cannot mandate submission. It's done voluntarily. Yeah. I remember a lady told me some time ago that um, her father had told her, you will respect, and he told the person's name. Now, this is a, a grown man telling a grown woman, his daughter, that he must respect this other person. It's mandatory. And I thought to myself, that's impossible. You can't make me respect you. Now, if you harm me or threaten to harm me or threaten to kill me, you might make me fearful. But I still don't respect. Fear and respect are not the same thing. Wives that fear the husband, they're not respecting them. They're fearful of them. And that's not the kind of submission Peter's talking about here. It's a completely different Biblical submission allows a wife to confidently follow her husband's lead. Ephesians 5.23 makes it perfectly clear that a man does have responsibility, responsibility for leadership in the home. Now, we could talk about that for a little while. God has said, man, you lead. Some men have said, I don't think so. And we've deferred to the wife. Shame on us. Shame on us. Men, get your mess together. You... If you're saved, the scriptures tell you how to be a man of God. It tells you how to lead the home, to be a father, to be a husband. If you don't know how, it's your own fault. It's out there. It's in the Word. Time and time again, how a man is to lead that home is explicit in the scriptures. A man has to take up the mantle that God gave him in the very beginning and be what he's called to be. And if a man will do that, that wife will honor him. That wife will love him. If he treats her as Christ and love her like Christ loved the church, she won't have any problem. I think this I've seen too in my 60 plus years. A woman wants to love and honor her husband. I've seen it time and time again. I've seen some sorry men who had a woman that could not help but love him and, and respect him and do what he said. And he didn't deserve it. I think God has got something in a woman, in, in her nature, that she wants this particular edict in the scriptures fulfilled. She wants to honor her husband. She wants to love him and essentially let him be the leader in the home. That's her desire. That's her will. And a man, if he'll accept that mantle, she'll continue to love and honor him and respect him in the relationship. Now, when man taking on the leadership role, uh, we need to consider a few things. Leadership does not give a husband the right to rob his wife of being a unique individual. He doesn't get to disregard or mock her opinions, her feelings, and he should, he should never misuse his leadership to get his own way. For a man of God to say, you do this or you do that because the, the gospel says you should, because your place, I'm the man, I'm in charge. That's not what submission is all about here in these scriptures. A husband instead must love his wife. He must cherish his wife. Die for her if necessary. Right. I, I got asked this question. Men, would you take a bullet for your wife? <laughs> well, thanks for the notes. Well, I thought a completely different response than that. I thought hands would go up, men would stand up, said, let it be me. Not one man did that, but Mitchell, forget it. You're too late to the party. <laughs> so I thought some might say, yeah, I would. Men, would you take a bullet for your children? Well, but, yeah, okay, well, I would, that's a good indicator of where you are with your relationship with your wife or not, but... It says, well, the scriptures, you know, we should love our wife, men, that we would die for them. Die for them. And I was going to follow up with a cute little question. Well, you take out the trash for them. 
You'll take a bullet, but will you take out a trash without mumbling and, and groaning and, you know, have to be pushed and, and threatened? Okay. So that trash stays there for four days. What's that smell in the, in the kitchen? Well, Adam didn't take out the trash like he told him to. No leadership in the home. A husband must love and cherish his wife, as I said before, even die for her, even as Christ died for the church. The husband should include his wife in important decisions and consider her perspective carefully and respectfully. She has an opinion. She's got a voice. Day by day, the husband should become increasingly sensitive to leading with love because He'll ultimately answer to God how he treated his wife. Many scriptures tell us, men, here's how you treat that little lady. It's one of the do's in the Bible. Do, do it this way. There are rules in the Bible on how to do things and what not to do. And it's explicitly written here, men, you're to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And we will have to give an account. We need to serve one another, to love one another, care for one another. R.C. Sproul said this, we are all servants. The only question is whom we will serve. Yeah. Is your spouse one of the persons you're least likely to serve without complaining? Because you know till death do us part. And there's not a whole bunch they can do about it. Because we're in the same till death do us part. Are you more inclined to be responsive and available or helpful to a co-worker, a good friend, than you would be a, your spouse? It should not be so if you're that way. S simply put, we shouldn't take advantage of our loved one, our husband or our wife. William P. Young said the following, Submission is not about authority, and it's not about obedience. It's all about relationships of love and respect, one for the other. Now, uh, Peter here, having made that statement, uh, wives, you're in subjection to your husband. Husbands, you know, love your wife. Let's look at verse 3. There's going to be a bit of a segue here. We're talking about wives now, still in verse 3. And these first six verses, they're really directed towards the wives for the most part. And we've got about 15 more minutes here, so bear with me. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, of wearing of gold, and of putting on of apparel. But it let, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price or very valuable. Again, I'm inclined to believe that Peter wrote about things he was approached with. And he was probably approached on the issue of the wives not really being in subjection to the husband. So Peter wrote about that in verse 1, verse 2. But there seemed to be a problem with the women in some communities put too much emphasis on dressing up. Did you know at this particular time in Roman culture, the more hair, the better. Women were so inclined to be in style and to be in style, Sammy, you got all the hair you could, yours and somebody else's if necessary, and you stacked them up on top of your head about as high as you could reach. That was in vogue at the time. Now, once you got that haystack up there, Brother Larry, 
you start plugging it with ornaments, um, uh, shiny stuff, uh, bandanas, ribbons, really pretty stuff. That was, you'd be looking good. High hair, beehive wouldn't hold a light to these. Is that what you call them, a beehive? That sound right? And so, it's just an outward indication of the fact that some of the women in the early church, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on how they looked. Uh, Adorning, let it not be that of an outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair, wearing of the gold, or putting on of apparel. Peter's saying, ladies, don't get misled. Don't get, be misguided. How you look is not of utmost importance. Sure, it's okay to look good, to present yourself respectfully in public and to your husband. But the important thing is not what's on the outside. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So this passage does not prevent women from trying to dress up and look, look good. It doesn't do that. It doesn't try to tell people what to wear, what not to wear. It doesn't do it. It is intended to tell the woman specifically here that true beauty is not the outward beauty. We're here, most of us are adults. We might have looked better, men and women, 30 years ago. We probably felt better, looked a little better, but now we have aged and hopefully aged gracefully, but beauty is not enduring necessarily. Some of us age better than others, but we know that what we look today is probably as good as we're going to look for the rest of our life. (laughs) That's a good chance. (laughs) So that's just where we are. And welcome to our world here, us 50 and above. It's not the hair, it's not the jewelry, it's not the cosmetics that make... One beautiful, the woman here. The beauty to be desired is to is the inner beauty built upon character, built upon a heart devoted to serving a living God. A Christian woman, she's able to dress in style as she wants to. But be aware, your focus. Your interest, your desire, your efforts should be in making that in you, your Christ-like nature, better, more presentable, meek, loving, caring. Peter's point here is that the woman will not win an unsaved person because of her hairstyle or because of her clothes. It won't happen. Now, will she attract men? Yes, she will. But the kind of man she wants, a godly man, She needs to have her heart right. She needs to live a life different from the world, serving God faithfully and fully with a gentle and quiet spirit. And in looking at this scripture, we thought of the scripture we said not too awful long ago, the relationship between Ruth and Boaz. What attracted Boaz to Ruth? Do you remember? Do you remember? We know that Ruth was a a, a good-looking woman. What else? really drew him to her, though? Was was it her behavior? She worked hard. And you know what, Miriam? She worked hard for a mother-in-law. Ladies? Not saying anything, you know, to offend. But history would prove that the the wife and the mother-in-law have not always gotten along well, Brother Larry. Am I right? Now, it seemed like the son... Or the husband and the pap in law get along pretty good for the most part, but there's something about them women and sharing that child, male child, or husband now. But here is Ruth left home because her mother in law needed her. And she left home and went to a foreign country to her, anyhow, and there she worked. Now, Boaz saw what she was doing and you know, Ruth was a good-looking woman, as, as far as we can understand the scriptures. She could have found her a man and dumped her mother-in-law if she wanted to. There was something in Ruth that attracted not just Boaz, but other people in the community. She was going out early in the day, working behind the harvest that she and her mother-in-law could live. 
survive. And Boaz saw that woman and said, you know what? I looked at you. You're different. Ruth was pretty, but that's not what he was after. He was after a woman that he could have as a wife and have children. And he saw in her uh, a nature that attracted him to her. Proverbs 31, 30 reads this way. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Ladies, let it be said. It's fine to be said that you're attractive, that you're, that you're well-dressed, you're well-spoken, all these outward things, but nothing could be better than to recognize, you be recognized as a woman of faith. A woman that lives it day in and day out. Her walk, her talk, her speech, her reputation, her name, it all points people to Jesus. <clears throat> Maybe one more verse or two. Are we on verse five now or close to it? Maybe. Yes. Okay. Let's go uh, one more uh, little section here. We'll quit. Still talking to the wives. For after this manner, we're talking still about the wives and the behavior of the wives and the presentation of the wives and the heart and meek spirit of the woman. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. We have studied Abraham, we've studied Sarah, and Sarah and Abraham were held in highest esteem by the early church, by the Jewish nation, even today. Abraham, I mean, he was, he was something special then and he is now. But so was his wife, Sarah. They, they uh, were called out, or Abraham was called out to go, and he went. And, and I've often thought about Abraham. He was not a perfect man. But boy, he's held in high esteem by the Jews. But Abraham, if you follow his life, he made some decisions that you would think, wow, I, I don't know the man of God should have done that or said that or, or behaved that way. But we know Abraham was not a perfect man, but he was a called man. Yeah. But now look who followed him as he picked up stake and moved to a foreign country. Here's his wife. And Peter is saying here, look how Sarah behaved towards her husband. And Peter's not saying Abraham was one that was perfect to follow, but yet she loved him, she was faithful to him, and she called him Lord, not the Lord as in God Almighty Lord, but as a one that she could look to, to lead and guide and direct and protect her and bear his children. So Peter here makes reference to Sarah and to Abraham. And we know from the scriptures that Sarah was a, another good-looking woman. Up in years, she was so beautiful as they traveled to foreign countries. Abraham says, my goodness, honey, you look so good. If we don't tell these leaders, these kings, and these other nations that you are, if we tell them you're my wife, I'm afraid they're going to want you. So let's call you my sister. They would kill me to have access to you, to bring you into their home, their harem, or whatever the application might be. So let's just pretend for this, for the time being, that I'm your brother, that I might live, essentially. Now, I don't know how Sarah felt about that. I don't know that she was pleased that her husband was willing to acknowledge her as his sister instead of standing up and doing the right thing and taking the bullet like we said before. Who's to say? You know, God was going to protect Abraham. These kings in these foreign countries that might have taken Sarah and tried to destroy Abraham in the process, God had a plan for Abraham. So we, that tells me right there his faith was weak, at least for, you know, from time to time. God says, Abraham, you will be the beneficiary of many, many, many children. Innumerable children. And that was a promise. 
But Abraham, like the rest of us, he probably had his moments where his faith was weak. But here is Sarah following Abraham wherever he went, and she didn't stick up the hand and say, that's it, I'm going back home. She followed him faithfully. She obeyed him and went wherever he said go. Now, I picked up on another word here. Um, in this manner, or after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also. When I heard about, or read rather, the reference old time, we use the phrase a lot, old timey this and old timey that. And we often say, Louise, in the olden days, in the olden times, Miss Flossie and Aunt Eula and, and Mr. Ellick and, you know, these men and women of faith were of the old times. Even Peter here says, let's look backwards a thousand years. These old timers, they knew how to be obedient to the Lord. Sure, they had mistakes, but Sarah, she understood her calling to be faithful to her husband and to serve him and to love him and to follow him wherever God would lead him. So we reflect back now, and I thought forward, in 20 years or 30 years, 40 years, our children will look back, maybe our grandkids, what will be their thought, what will be their, their illumination on what it was like in the old timey days where Mr. Ellick and Aunt Eula and Miss Flossie and the list goes on and on, the people they were, the cornerstone, the patriarch and matriarchs of our church, we respect them, don't we? They were men and women of faith, and we, we honor them today by even mentioning their name. There were many of them. In looking forward, will they look back to 2024 and say, in the old days, Bruce and Johnny and Steve and Brother Larry, well, they have kind things to say about us, us being faithful, us being submissive to one another in love. As a church, loving one another, loving spouses, loving one another. Let it be said that we were faithful and good things can be said about our generation in decades to come. Again, let me state this subjection that Sarah had to Abraham, that the wife has had to the husband today, it's completely volunteer. It's been commissioned by the Scripture, but you still have to want to do it. Again, the husband is not to lord over his wife. He is unable to dictate true submission. The, wife, the Bible does not teach that the wife is less than her husband that she is a servant to her husband, that she cannot have her own opinion, her own will, but, but that she cannot make independent decisions. However, God has established that the husband should be the spiritual leader of the home, and that both husband and wife and the church as a whole should submit to Christ. And we'll, two verses, and we'll stop here. Like, I will tell you, Peter here, the first six verses are instructing the women on how to behave in the home and to the husband. I will give you a preview. Peter takes one verse to tell the husbands how to behave. Just say it. What now? Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, Megan, don't confuse my argument here with the facts, okay? <laughs> uh, it just blows my whole philosophy. But let, let me read you two verses about, again, the wife and, uh, and the relationship and being submissive. And, um, it says here in, um, I think it's Ephesians 5, 18 and 21. For all this to work, folks, this submission one to the other, it requires that we be obedient to the Spirit. And so in Ephesians, uh, Paul's writing to the church. It said, Church, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Verse 21. Church, he says, submit yourself one to another in fear or reverence to God. So here, Paul and Peter, and you look behind their writings, 
they, they're very similar in how they address issues in the church. And you wouldn't really know which one you're reading behind if you didn't know the title of the book. So here uh, it seems that Peter and Paul are in lockstep here and talk to the church, trying to encourage them to be on the best behavior, especially as it relates to the husband and the wife. Now, we'll hold off till next week on uh, talking to the husbands about their behavior towards their wives. And women, if you've got any specific questions, you know, funnel those to me and we'll try to present those next week. Any questions, comments? Appreciate you paying attention, staying awake. That's been important to me. You know, I know you're tired and kids got to get to bed. Let's stand up then. We'll hold off on a song. I have one, but we're going to hold off on a song and be dismissed to go home and get some rest. And I hope and pray that you have a good week. Pray for us as we continue in chapter 3 next willing, next week, Lord willing. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings, your mercy, Lord. We are so uh, thankful, Lord, for the blessed occasion where we can come see these young people today, uh, share with the church uh, what's been hidden in their hearts. We pray, God, for each one of us this week, Lord, and the husband and the wife in the home, Lord, that we can grow closer to one another, Lord. I pray that the uh, the scriptures might encourage us to be faithful and obedient in submission one to the other in fear of the Lord. And, Lord, if we'll do that, the family will be stronger, the husband-wife relationship will grow, there'll be better parents, and there'll be unity in the home. And, Lord, we'll study next week where even our prayers will be impacted by our being submissive one to the other. I pray, God, you bless, touch, heal the sick and the suffering. Keep us safe this week, Lord. Bless our families and our loved ones. And help us, Lord, to be able to come back to the house of the Lord on Wednesday. We give thanks and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.